Uh, But I want to begin today in Acts chapter 4. We're going to read 22 verses, so lots of scripture. Hang in with me. Uh, This, to give you the context of what's occurring, I already mentioned this, but there was a crippled man, a lame man in the temple, and Peter and John run into this man, and they say, rise and walk, and he rises and he walks, and this creates quite a stir in the temple. Uh, By what power did this man stand up and walk is the key question of the day. We'll start reading in Acts chapter 4, verses 1, and it says, and as they were speaking to the people, this is Peter and John. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees, the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed, because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. They counted people based upon their households. So there was around 5,000 households, which is crazy. On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power and what name did you do this? And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God then raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has now become the the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that, no, for that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak, to, no, to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for... uh, this story. Thank you for this place, for this people. Lord, I pray in this time, in these next moments, God, that like a rushing wind, you came in that day, that you will come in this day, that you would awaken us, move in us, God, Lord. We want your fire. In Jesus' name, amen. Title of the message today is Unavoidable Questions. Uh, There's some moments in our life that just evoke questions. Uh, I remember, uh, I don't know, some years ago, I was watching a magician. You've probably been to a magician before, and he did something that just uh, quite, it it confused me. I was like, how on earth did he do this? 
Uh, he was uh, talking with someone from the audience, presumably that had never met before, asking questions. He had some sort of tablet that was covered up, and uh, they answered questions that there was no way that he, this man could have known. And at the end of this trick, he opened up the tablet, and in this almost perfect writing, it was written on the board. And I sat there, I was like, how on earth did he do this? Now, maybe some of you know, maybe some of you watched the YouTube video, you could probably go watch the YouTube video today, because there's a reason, he did it somehow. But there are also questions in our lives that occur, questions like Rashika's parents or someone that was healed from cancer, or even some things that occur in our lives, changed lives, the power to forgive someone that we could never forgive before. Things that occur in our lives or in someone else's lives that we would say, how on earth did that happen? Today we're going to look at a question that is asked amongst the religious leaders, and I want us to see what does this mean for our day? What did it mean for that day? What does it mean for our day? Now, we're in a series called Wind and Fire, and uh, this series comes from Acts chapter 2. Uh, in What we're doing is we're walking through the book of Acts, and we're trying to understand the movement and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, how he moved then and with a longing that he would move in our day in the same way. And the hope for this series is that you would catch a, or that you would get a correct theology of the Holy Spirit, that you would understand how the Spirit moves. Second, that you would experience a fresh wind of the Spirit in your life. And lastly, that you would join me, that we would pray with passion and fervor that uh, the Spirit would revive our land, that he would renew our land. And so, uh, I don't know about you, but I'm ready for some wind. I'm ready to catch the fire of the Spirit. And uh, in this passage, what I'd like to do is pull up a picture just to help you visualize. It's a picture that was painted a number of years ago. If you're close enough, you might be able to see this. Uh, but we can see the crippled man, the lame man, who is sitting down. He's raising his hand. And uh, this is a picture that was painted to represent the healing that had occurred in the temple. And last week we learned that this man was lame from birth. He could not walk at birth. He was placed at a gate called Beautiful. It was a beautiful gate, massive doors, 75 feet high, overlaid with brass. And so it was literally beautiful. And as they were trying to figure out what is the purpose of this lame man's life, they, I imagine somewhere along the way said, well, let's put him at the gate, we'll have him beg for money, this will be his existence. And every day, they would put this man there, he would sit there and beg, and if you were part of their life, if you were part of uh, the journey of uh, Israel in that day, you would have known this man. You would have seen this man day after day after day begging at the temple. And what is crazy is that Peter and John come walking along full of the Holy Spirit and he reaches out to him. He says, hey, I need money. Would you give me money? Peter gazes at him, gives him his full attention. He says, gold and silver I do not have, but what I have I give you. Rise, walk. This man, for the first time in 40 years, gets up. He starts to walk. His whole future, the trajectory of his life changes as he can now move and walk. And he jumps up and down and he celebrates. Oh, look what God has done. And this creates a massive quandary in the temple. A stirring in the temple that people are talking about this. And, and, and they move over to Solomon's portico or the, a porch, Solomon's porch, where they would come together to debate things and to teach things. And they come there and people are asking, how on earth did this happen? And Peter takes the opportunity to preach the gospel and uh, to explain to them that this happened at the name of Jesus. Well, this creates a major problem for the religious leaders, those that oversaw the temple. 
for a couple of reasons. Number one, because Peter was not authorized to teach in the temple. They were very careful and very systematic about who could teach, who could speak. He was not authorized to teach, and so that's the first problem. But uh, more importantly, the problem is that he condemns the acts of those that ran the temple. He says, like, you were the ones that killed Jesus. And the, the Jesus that you killed, God rose from the dead. And he is alive today. And uh, it is by his name. And uh, as the scriptures say, so here's what I want to do today. I want to um, uh, you know, look at who was there in that moment, just for a couple minutes, and I want you to think about who do you identify with most. So who was there, then I want to talk about what happened there, and then end today with what might happen here as we look at this story. Uh, so we'll begin with who was there. I'll just read some of the scripture quickly again for you. It says, and as they were speaking to the people, the priests... The, capital of the, the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, and notice it says they were greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now there's three groups that I'll recognize that were there. The first group is who I'll call the establishment. Okay, those who grew up in the family, in the institution, and they were, I mean, this was part of their livelihood. They were, they, th this whole temple environment was run by the establishment, the group that oversaw it. And you see a couple of these individuals here. You see, first of all, the priests. These were those that administered the sacrifices and carried out all the different tasks that occurred in the, in the temple. There was also uh, the temple guard. Uh, the, the, the Rome did not allow for disorder, right? And so Rome said, no, you're going to have police. You're going to have a temple guard that is going to ensure that things occur properly. And if there's any problems, we will step in and we will assist with this. So there was a temple guard there, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees. Sadducees was a religious group. Often we hear about the Pharisees during Jesus' day, but the Sadducees were also there. Two different groups didn't really like each other, I don't think, that much. They had different theology, but the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. And so it makes sense that the temple guard is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What is going on here? There's a stirring. People are talking. Some guy's teaching. They shouldn't be teaching. And he's teaching the resurrection of the dead. And so there's this massive stirring, and the establishment is there. And I, I just want you to, for a moment, think about what it would take if one of these individuals that was part of the established religion, the leaders, were to repent and believe? If, what would occur if they were to choose to follow Jesus? Uh, they had grown up in this. Their parents, their grandparents uh, oversaw this. Their careers depended upon life in the temple. It was their identity their personal identity. And can you imagine if one of them were to say, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to repent what we did to Jesus so wrong. We see the God who raised him now doing a work in the temple, and I'm choosing to repent and to believe. Uh, these individuals would not just be following Jesus, they would be leaving their family identity, their, ideal, their uh, ideology. Uh, they would have to find a new career because their career would have ended. And I, I want to just for a moment um, talk about what it means sometimes to follow Jesus. Sometimes it means leaving what we came from and stepping out into what he has for us. And that is really hard. For some of you who may be here today, I remember a number of years ago, I was a youth pastor over at the Avon campus for a number of years. I remember one year we were working the Blitz, that's an all-night event. 
which I don't think they do anymore. But uh, I did a lot of them back in the day. I think 15 blitzes through the years, staying up all night with 150 kids and going to all these different places. And, you know, we'd always have these volunteers teams that would be at different places serving food. So one night we're, I think, at Farmington Farms, uh, currently uh, Farmington Big Sky, and we're up there overnight and we have these adults there are helping. They're, they're coming in for like two hours, not staying up all night, but they're coming in for two hours and they're serving food. And there's this one woman there and I think she grew up, I can't remember where she grew up, but she grew up either um, you know, from a Buddhist family or Hindu family. I can't remember the religion, but I remember talking to her at 2 o'clock in the morning as uh, a lot of the kids were starting to fall asleep or were off doing their things and just asking her about her faith journey, her faith background. And she was very involved at our church. She was great service, but she said, you know, I love this church and I love the Christian life, but I am having such a difficult time choosing to follow Jesus. Because she said, if I choose to follow Jesus, I will be communicating to my parents and my grandparents and everywhere I've come from that I am leaving that life and I am starting this new life with Jesus. And there may be some of you here today that you're in that place. It's not easy but it's something that you should consider. There are some critical questions here that we have to answer about what happened in that day and what happened in our day. So there was uh, the establishment. There was also the crowd. Now, if you just look at the picture, we go back to the picture here. I mean, you just kind of look at this and you think about like some of those people. Uh, you see, can see some of the men or the, even I think there's children in it just sort of walking along. There's a woman carrying water on her head and they're just going about daily life. They're part of the crowd. They're just getting it done. And there may be some of you here today that are part of the crowd. You're not committed to Jesus. You're not truly a follower of Jesus. Maybe you have some religious or Christian identity, but if it came to like, are you willing to put your neck on the line for Jesus, which we're going to see in just a moment, that's not you right now. Like, let's just be real. You're part of the crowd. Uh, Your Christianity is casual. And there were some of those people there on that day Verse 4, it said that many of those who had heard the word and seen what happened, they believed. And so something changed in their life. And I wonder if there's some of you today that it's time for a change. It's time to walk in a new way. The final group that was there on this day was, I'll just call the committed. They were those that had chosen to follow Jesus. Those that said, Where else could I go? And what else can I do? Because you are the son of the living God. And I could do a whole bunch of other things in my life, but it would be an absolute waste of a time if it's not with you, God. Uh, We see this in verse 13. This is speaking of Peter and John and certainly others that were with them, but it says, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And so these were uneducated common men from Galilee, and they were following Jesus. They were committed to Jesus. So I just want to say to you today that Jesus believes you have what it takes to be his disciple. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what uh, degree is hanging on your wall. It doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter what your socioeconomic background is. It doesn't matter what, where you graduated in your class or where you might graduate in your class or whether you might graduate. Jesus believes you have what it takes Jesus has been for years using people, common people, to do uncommon things, to do the unexpected. And it's not like these men were stupid. It's not like they didn't work hard. But the Holy Spirit came on them, and they did incredible things. There was the establishment, there was the crowd, 
and there was the committed there in that moment that we just saw. That's who was there, what happened there. Uh, what, what happened there was a man got up and walked after 40 years, and that evoked a question which is an unavoidable question. You would have asked it if you were standing there on that day, and the question is this, verse 7. It says, when they had set them in their midst, they inquired, by what power and what name did you do this? Like we just saw something we've never seen before. It's not something that we may ever see again. By what power and by what name did this happen? We recognize these are ordinary men, but there was something extraordinary that occurred in their midst. And what happens next is critical. Verse 8, it says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said, and he preaches some pretty direct harsh but loving truth to them. He says, listen, in fact, let me just read it because we got to get into this. But he says, filled with the Holy Spirit, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, you know who he is because you crucified him. By the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, by his name, this man is standing before you well. And there is salvation in no one else, no one, no other name under heaven given among men whereby we might be saved. Peter preaches the gospel. I want to just ask you a couple questions in application. If you are a follower, if you are part of the committed, there's a couple questions that I think we have to ask ourselves, unavoidable questions. And the first one is this. Is your life questionable? Is your life questionable? Does your life evoke questions? See, the point here is that if we're living like they were living, there's going to be some things that are going to be happening in our lives, through our lives, around our lives, where people are going to ask questions. It's going to evoke questions. I don't understand how you can forgive that person for what they did to you. It doesn't make any sense that you would do that. I don't understand how you are a different person today than you were in that day. And maybe even I don't understand how that person, you got together and you prayed together and like you just sought the Lord and you saw a person healed. Because see, when things like this happen, they evoke questions. People start to ask, like, well, what's going on? with that group of people. As we talk about the wind and fire of the Holy Spirit, I mean, my prayer, my hope is that, oh, Spirit, like, may we catch the wind of the Spirit and not miss what the Spirit is doing this fall, in this time, in this place, that the Spirit would do things that are not ordinary, but extraordinary. And then the second question is really important because people are going to ask questions. And when they do, when the questions come, will you be full of the Holy Spirit and ready to answer? I mean, that's my hope in my life. So spirit move. It's not me. I just want to be around what you're doing. And then when people start to ask, I'm going to be like, okay, God, like now's my opportunity. I'm just going to proclaim the name of Jesus. It is by the name of Jesus that this happened in my life. Peter answers them. He answers them directly about Jesus. I think Jesus himself, even regardless of what happens in our day, Jesus himself 
evokes a question that every one of you have to answer, every one of us have to answer. It's an undeniable question, an unavoidable question. You know what the question is? Who is Jesus? Because Jesus is not just some guy that, you know, kind of lived in the world and, you know, did his thing and, you know, we wrote the history books. Jesus changed this world like no person in history. Do you understand that the very year that we live in today is measured by his birth? He's not just your run-of-the-mill prophet. He changed this world. And what makes me ask, like, how did this happen? Because Jesus grew up in Nazareth. In fact, they say, Jesus of Nazareth. Well, do you know, if you lived in that day, you would know Nazareth. Nazareth is like a town in Galilee, somewhere up in the north, where no one of any influence or intellectual notoriety came from. He grew up in Nazareth. And he didn't have any money, and he didn't have a big following. He didn't get involved in politics to try to change the world. Uh, he, he, uh, he really, from a, uh, from a, a modern perspective of how we impact change in the world, he had nothing to offer. He invested in somewhere around 120 people who, once the Holy Spirit came upon them, they radically changed the world. He fulfilled prophecies that were given hundreds of years beforehand. They're written down, and if you go through all of them, it's an impossibility that any one person could accomplish those unless there was a God involved that was orchestrating everything together. And he stands today, even in the minds of those who would be secular, who would not be believers, he stands today as the center of history. There's no person in history who more songs have been sung, no person who more paintings have been painted, no person who books have been written. In fact, the Bible is the most selling book, highest selling book in history, and that will never change. And this all came from one solitary Man, and it is an unavoidable question that you need to answer in your life. Because if what Jesus said is true, then it shapes your future in a way that you cannot avoid it and avoid him. In this case, in this instance, in the name of Jesus... In his power, the power of the Holy Spirit, co-equal with Jesus and God, this man stood up and walked. And thousands believed. Thousands started to change their life, started to follow Jesus. And if you look actually at history, and you look at hospitals, and you look at the world, uh, you look at even the role and, and the perspective of the different genders. I mean, Jesus, there's no person in history that has affected this like the God who came to this world, Jesus. This happened in their day. And the question is, as we continue on in this story of Jesus, what might happen in our day? I want to just note a couple things about this movement. This movement, the early church movement, is growing and the Spirit's moving. Uh, Several things that are characteristic about it. First of all, the early church movement was a Holy Spirit movement through and through. It didn't happen through any kind of uh, uh, church growth principles or business principles. Let's just apply these to the church. It was the Holy Spirit doing the work. And if we want to see this today, let me just speak to our church family right here. If you're visiting and you're part of God's family, I'm speaking to you. Nothing's going to happen here in people's lives based upon your abilities. Jesus said pretty clearly, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. But without me, you can do nothing, right? 
And so if we're abiding in Christ, we're going to be going through this life, and this is my hope. Like, uh, you know, we were just praying beforehand. Somebody's praying about how busy we are as people. And it's like, I don't know about you, but like for me, it's kind of that way. It's like, man, I'm so stressed. Like, I just want to slow down and sit down. Some of you got little kids. This is really hard to do. But nevertheless, sit down and just get soaked and what God has to say, what the Spirit is doing, amen? Like, if, if we would just do that every day, every morning, it's not about have to, it's about, why wouldn't I want to just get filled up with the Spirit? I'm, like, there's going to be a shaking that occurs around you, and when it does, people are going to ask questions. Unavoid, it's an unavoidable, how'd that happen? It's crazy, man. Um, Acts 4, 31, it says this, when it speaks about the community, it says, and, and, and when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God, the boldness. That's my prayer this year. Like, first and foremost, oh God, may we experience the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. May we walk so closely with you that you would do a work in our time and a place we've never seen before. God, would you work in my life? Like, I want my kids to be asking like that. How'd that happen? I got nothing. I'm just a common man little bit of education. I'm just trying to be filled with the Spirit and let him do the work. And when he does, I will proclaim the name above all names. It is a Holy Spirit movement through and through. And oh, what he did in that day that he might do in our day. Second thing I would say about that movement was it was not a combative movement. It wasn't like, let's go to Rome and let, let's like create a partnership with Rome and make this happen. It wasn't like, hey, we're uh, going to put you in jail because we don't know really what to do with you. We recognize something pretty extraordinary just happened here, but um, we don't know what to do. So we're putting you in jail tonight until the big dogs get here tomorrow and we can, you know, <laughs> put you under this inquisition, right? You know, so it wasn't like, Oh no, let me raise up a crowd of people to fight for certain you know, perspectives or let me pull out a sword and cut off your ear. Peter had already tried that approach. They went to jail. And later in the book of Acts, they actually get out of jail in the middle of the night because they're praising, but this night he didn't release them. They sat in jail for a night and they came out the next day and they proclaim the name of Jesus. How we approach this as a church, as the movement of God, is really important. doesn't mean that we don't stand up sometimes, but how we stand up is really important. Last thing I'll just mention about this movement is that it was a communal movement. I'll just read uh, Acts 4, 32, which is sort of a precursor to where we're going to go next week, but it says, uh, 32, it says, now... Uh, the full number of those who had believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to them was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection. Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands and houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and they laid it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed, distributed to each as any had need. What you see here, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not suggesting a commune here. Like I'm just saying it was in relationship with one another, supporting one another with the same heart and the same soul. Like I'm for you. You're my brother. You're my sister. I'll be there for you. And they were living this life in the good times and in the bad times. And those that were experiencing bad times, those that were experiencing good times were like, you're my brother. You're like, 
me. You're not me, you're mine. You're, you, you, the scriptures say that uh, they were one another together. And that's why as we pursue the movement of the Holy Spirit, uh, we have these things called groups. And I will just tell you, these are hard. They're hard to establish. They're hard to, 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 to grow tight. And there's all different forces that are working from schedules to you know, challenges that we go through as people. But we have groups, and the whole point of groups is to take the bigness that is here and to bring it down to the smallness so that we can get into life together, right? And so we have three types of groups. There's neighbor groups, men's and women's groups, and care groups. And I would just say that uh, I would ask you, if you're part of our church family, the question is, who are you walking with? Who are you praying with at at the beginning of this or at the base of this is prayer, that we're praying together, that we're communicating with each other. Guys, I'm going through the worst time today. I need some, prayer. I need some help. Um, I would invite you to do life together, to join together, uh, to support one another, to encourage one another to disciple and mentor and model together. And that there's no greater life than to do that as part of the kingdom of God. You have to step into relationship. Rashika that was up here is our connections leader. What does that mean? It means that when someone walks through the door for the very first time, she's responsible. She's not only responsible, but she's overseeing, helping them to get connected in relationships, not just a dinner, but like, hey, I'm doing life together and joining the mission and the people of God. And so she's working on that. She's also working with our current congregation to help them to connect. And so we're all working together, but on this form here on the back, it says, are you interested in joining or leading a group? We need some that would step in the power of the Holy Spirit into leading. And this is always somewhat of a challenge, but as we are this week taking everything that we know about who will lead And who wants to be part of groups? We're just putting it together so that we can get moving on this. And so I would just invite you that you would stop on the way out today and uh, you would meet with Rashika or Bob McPeak will be there too and just say, I'm interested in a group. I don't even know. I'm just kind of interested. That will allow us to effectively do this together. Amen. I'm going to ask the worship team to come. We're going to sing one final song in closing today. Uh, Just before we do that, I want to ask you... Three unavoidable questions. Three questions that I think are unavoidable about our lives. Would you just stand with me? Would you stand with me as we respond today? The way that this works, by the way, is we come into um, services, and the goal is that we, for 70 minutes, would just preach the truth, sing the truth, read the truth, testify to the truth. That's what we've done today, right? Right? All so that we can respond to the truth. The scriptures say, what does it matter to hear it and to go and do nothing about it? (laughs) Be ye not hearers of the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Like, go live it. And so as we respond today, I have three questions for you, unavoidable questions to this message today. First one is this. By what power... And by what name do you find your salvation? By what power and by what name will you be saved on the day when your body stops breathing? It's going to happen. It's 100% certainty that the day is coming when you will die. And the question on that day is who will be your savior? Peter and John who walked with Jesus and saw the miracles and performed the miracles and saw the living Christ, here's what they would say to you. There's no other name whereby you will be saved. It's not 
in anyone's name or ideology in this world. It is the name of Jesus, who is God and God alone. He is is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three persons existing in perfect harmony and community for all of eternity, which make up God. It's what we call the Trinity. It's a lesson for another day if you're a little confused right now. But Jesus was God. He came to this world to rescue you, to save you, because our sin separates from him. Our sin is like a dividing factor that separates us from God and caused death and devastation in this world. Just look at the news. There is a lot of death and devastation. And God, when he saw that no person could solve the problem, he said, well, I'll go and I'll get it done. And he went to a cross and he died on a cross because the wages of sin is death. And the only way God can righteously accept you into heaven is for you to be righteous. And so Jesus died for you so that you could receive his righteousness. And on the day when you do die and you stand before God, you say, I'm I'm, I'm standing here because of Christ. I've received him. That is the invitation for you today, to trust in the name of Jesus for, as your Savior. Second question is, is your life questionable? If you're part of the family of God, is the Spirit moving around you? Are people asking questions? If not, maybe it's time to turn our gaze to the things of heaven, to turn our gaze to the things of the Holy Spirit. Oh God, would you just move? I don't want to miss it can't do it. Teach me how to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. Last question is, when the questions come, because they will, will you be full of the Holy Spirit? Will you be totally surrendered? Come back next week. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit, to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit? Amen.